Um, thank you for coming. This, um, this presentation was requested <coughs> by AAPG, uh, by Robbie Grease, when she was chair of the Distinguished Lecture Committee in June of 2010, as I was finishing my gig as uh, Sections Vice President. And it was requested because at that time, you'll remember, Macondo was still flowing, and she was extremely frustrated at the poor reportage that was coming out, the poor transfer of information to the public and to the industry. And she seemed to think that uh, I could put something together that uh, would help people understand and oil spills and help them put them in perspective. And so that's what this presentation is for. And we could put a subtitle on it at this point and say, well, we're going to talk about, as well, America's energy and economic future, because it's all tightly interwoven. Uh, this is the uh, 63rd time I've given this presentation in just over 18 months, and I still have uh, six, seven months to go in my, uh, my tour. Um, and it changes. You'd think that, well, you finally got it down. <coughs> It changes, because uh, I try to keep it current. And so this <coughs> slide deck is new as of 5 o'clock last evening. <laughs> so you're going to have to bear with me if I don't have the transitions exactly where they need to be. And I'll in even include comments from today's news as we go through it. The presentation is in three parts, so I'm going to tell you what you're listening to. We're going to go through the worst oil spills in history. And because you're number 63 in the presentation, presentation sequence, <clears throat> you're going to have the benefit of hearing some bonus spills that I've been asked about through time. Um, so we'll go through that, and then we're going to talk about the constituencies. Who are the various groups who felt that they needed to engage themselves in the public debate about oil spills while Macondo was ongoing? And then finally, I'm going to help you with some data, and I'm going to put oil and gas spills in the oil and gas industry and energy, hydrocarbon energy, in the context of the rest of the social issues that we're dealing with in this country that are driving public debate and driving some political decisions that may be quite disastrous for us as a society. And so that's, that's where we're headed. Right? And this will take 55.63 minutes to go through. And I'm sure, I'm sure my, uh, my engineering colleague here from past will keep me to the second. And so with that, the 10 worst spills in history. The first one wasn't really much of a spill at all, was it? It's the Gulf War in 1991. This, of course, was in Kuwait. And there were between 240 and 340 million gallons spilled. And I realize you are an audience that's accustomed to barrels. Uh, but I do this for audiences that don't know barrels. And so they can relate to gallons better. And I trust all of you are sufficiently skilled in your arithmetic that you can divide by 42 and come up with a number of barrels. So I'm not going to worry about you. <laughs> Cleanup. Cleanup involved just shutting in the wells and pipes. About 25 miles of boom were used where oil had gotten into uh, the sea. And 21 skimmers were used. Long-term damage. According to UNESCO, there was little damage to the coral or to the local fisheries. Right. The number two was the Hickstock well, offshore Mexico in 1979. There were about 140 million gallons spilled. The cause was a pressure buildup and a well blowout and an explosion. Cleanup involved all of the things that you heard employed for the Deepwater um, Horizon event. There were junk shots, dispersants, burning, and uh, ultimately relief wells. The Atlantic Empress in 1979. The Atlantic Empress went down offshore Trinidad and Tobago in the West Indies and spilled about 88 million gallons. The cause was a two-tanker collision. Two-tanker collision. They couldn't see this 900-foot boat and <laughs> ran into it. Cleanup, firefighting, dispersants, they tried to tow it to shallow water where <laughs> they could then pump unspilled oil out. They failed. There was an explosion and the vessel sank. The Fergana Valley, 1992. The Fergana Valley is in Uzbekistan. Again, it was about 88 million gallons that were lost. Cause was, a, again, a blowout, well failure. 
It's listed as uh, one of the worst in the history of Asia. Cleanup, there wasn't any. All the oil soaked into the ground before the crews got there to do anything, and they didn't worry about it past that. The Nauruk oil field, 1983, this is in the Persian Gulf. About 80 million gallons were lost, and the cause was a tanker collision with a platform during a small border altercation between a couple of the nations there. It was left to flow for seven months, because any time someone went out to try and clean it up, one of the belligerents would rocket the platform. Clean up, booms and skimmers, and just shutting in the wells finally. The ABT summer in 1991 is number six in the hit parade. It was off the coast of Angola, about 80 million gallons in the manifest. Cause was a shipboard explosion. Clean up, well, they let it burn and sink. Impact none known due to the sinking, burning, and dispersion by high seas during the storm. Number seven, Castillo de Belver in 1983. Um, I make an insertion here that uh, anytime someone's making a presentation on oil spills, they have to have an oiled bird. So here's my oiled bird picture. Right? This is uh, off Saldana Bay in South Africa. The uh, mountain in the background is Table Mountain, and Cape Town sits at its base. You're looking northeast here. About 80 million gallons lost. The cause was a shipboard fire. Cleanup involved the breakup and sinking of the vessel. Some dispersants were used. About 1,500 birds were oiled. No fisheries impact. Now, here I can tell you I have been to Saldana Bay. I have visited this penguin colony. It's quite happy. I did not meet this particular individual, I don't think. <laughs> but there is no evidence that there was ever a spill here. None. And the observation I would offer to you is that this environment is in pretty good shape today because we can see here's the top of the food chain. And if the top of the food chain is intact, then the rest of it is too. The Amico Cadiz. 1978, I'll draw your attention to the apparent condition of the bow of the hull. All right, this is off Brittany, France. There were about 70 million gallons in the manifest. The cause was a steering failure in a storm. The vessel then ran aground and started to break up. Here you can see that the, uh, the keel has broken. Cleanup was the use of some dispersants, vacuum trucks, and by hand. Now, to give you some perspective, I'm told that this photograph was not shot from an aircraft. It was shot from the headlands, similar to the headlands that were scaled at Normandy Beach in World War II. So this was right at the shore. Um, I have not visited this beach. A, a friend of mine in Paris, who is a native Parisian, has visited it for me, and she informs that there's no evidence there was ever a spill here. Number nine, the Odyssey oil spill in 1988. This was 700 miles off Nova Scotia, which puts it well out toward and into the Grand Banks, one of the richest fisheries in the world. There were about 43 million gallons lost. The cause was that the ship broke up and sank in a storm. Cleanup, none. Natural dispersion. And in terms of the health of the Grand Banks, most of what you see in the grocery store freezer case in the fish department comes from here. So that's doing OK. <clears throat> And number 10, the MT Haven, which in 1991 was in Genoa Harbor. It lost 42 million gallons. And the cause was poor maintenance and an explosion and fire. Cleanup, well, again, there was an attempt to tow it into shallower water where it sank. Um, it is now, for those of you who are interested in sport diving, the largest shipwreck in the world available for sport diving. And it's in Genoa Harbor. Uh, barriers and vacuums were used. Now. What did all of those have in common? They all had two causes <coughs> shared. One was poor maintenance, and the second was human error. Those, either together or one at a time, were the cause of all of those spills, except for the Gulf War. Now, that brings us to the third thing that they have in common, which is that none of these has had long-term lasting environmental impact. None of them. And that's an important observation. And that then brings us to this one, which you know occurred in 2010 here in the Gulf of Mexico. There were about 185 million gallons lost. 
and that number comes from the President's Special Commission report that came out in December or January uh, following the event, so December of 2010 or January of 2011. Cause was a blowout and fire. Cleanup involved the use of dispersants, skimmers, burn-off, barriers, by hand, uh, efforts, several different efforts to cap the well, and then finally relief wells were drilled. And that's what took care of it. What was the cause? Human error. Human error. And just like the others, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill will have had no lasting environmental impact. Ultimately, Mother Nature will handle it. And that's a quote from Ed Overton, who's a professor emeritus of coastal studies at LSU. And Ed's a particularly important person to quote, because during the spill, he was one of the more popular talking heads brought onto cable. And what he said during the spill was that this might take generations for the Gulf to heal. Generations. This is what he said in April of the next year, here in Houston, to the luncheon of the Environmental Division of AAPG. A huge turnabout, turnaround. And his conclusion has been reinforced by two studies that were published by the National Research Council in January of this year, January of 2012, which found that the cloud of oil that was in the water column caused by the dispersant that was applied at the wellhead on the seafloor had all been consumed had all been consumed by the bacteria in the warm waters of the Gulf. It's gone. Now, is there heavy oil still on the seafloor down current from the wellhead? Yes. And that's going to take a while to clean up because it's at between minus 1 and minus 2 degrees centigrade on the seafloor. It's very cold, very low biologic activity. Is there oil that has settled out onto the shelf? that will be stirred up from time to time with storms? Yes. Is it causing major problems? No, because if it were, we wouldn't be fishing again. So that's a perspective that hasn't been offered much <coughs> to you or by the press to the rest of our citizenry. Now, the, the three bonus spills that you get because you're number 63, the spills that I've been asked about are the Lakeview Gusher in 1905 in Southern California, which blew out and flowed 20,000 barrels a day for 18 months as a gusher that was 150 feet high and became a major tourist attraction until it lost reservoir pressure and bridged off. Um, I've seen a number of estimates on it. Um, the most popular is that it spilled about 11.8 million barrels, so a lot of oil. The second one I get asked about is the Exxon Valdez. And if you, if you troll the internet and do searches of worst oil spills in history, what you'll find is the Exxon Valdez comes out about number 37 or 38, depending on the date of your, of your uh, study base. So it's not a very big one at all. And the last one I've been asked about kind of surprised me. I was asked about World War II. World War II. And so some people at uh, in Washington, D.C., helped me chase some, down some numbers. Don Juckett, who used to head up the uh, Washington office for AAPG, in fact, was quite helpful. And between the spring of 1942 and the spring of 1943, there were 126 tankers sunk by U-boats in the greater Gulf of Mexico area. Yeah. I'm seeing eyes get like this, really. Yeah, 26 of them were sunk right off the Delta because the refineries didn't shut down at night. They still had all their lights on. And the U-boats would simply profile the vessels as they came out of the river, up against the lights. So 26. At an average tanker size in World War II of about 100,000 barrels, that means there were 2.6 million barrels of oil spilled in less than a year right at the Delta. And we made no effort to clean any of that up. We had some other things that we were concerned with at the time, you'll remember. But by the 1950s, when the environmental movement got started here in North America, what people wanted to see were baseline studies. And the Gulf at that time was considered to be pristine. So the Gulf had healed from all of that damage. Those should be important takeaways. So now, let's move on to part two of this conversation. 
Let's talk about the constituencies that involved themselves in this. And certainly the corporations that were operating the well, owned the well, or were part of the well in any way are going to be involved and still are involved. The various regulatory agencies at uh, state, federal, and local levels. You and I. You and I. And here's where I'm going to send you away later with uh, an admonition that you and I have done an abysmal job of fulfilling our ethical responsibilities with regard to oil spill conversation. I'm going to help you repair that deficit. The media, I've been asked whether my choice of the color yellow for this disc was a subliminal thing. It was not. Various legislative bodies, the courts, who are going to be engaged for the rest of my adult life, it seems which I hope to be long, and the public. So let's sort through these one at a time, and let's start with the corporations. And let's start with what the site looked like immediately after the Deepwater Horizon sank, when a number of research institutions and media were seeking access. They were all wanting access to the site, and both BP and the Coast Guard said, no, you can't come out here because it's too congested. All right? So what did they mean by too congested? The deep water horizon went down right here, between this little floater and the drill ship in the background, right there. And it landed on the seafloor over here. Right? What you don't see in this view is the second, the second uh, semi-submersible that's just off the field of view to the right. right. It and the one in the foreground were drilling the relief wells. The drill ship was operating over the top of the wellhead, still trying to work the wellhead. All of those had pipe strings, obviously, underneath them, going through the water column. Then you can see the raft of uh, work boats out there, many of which are quite large, many of which have booms on them. Any place you see a boom, that vessel is the mothership for a remotely operated vehicle on the seafloor. And there were seven of those. So in addition to the three drill strings, there were seven cable systems that were running through the water column. And all of that is the congestion that people were concerned would get entangled by other vessels being brought in from various research institutions. And that's why people were chased away, that level of congestion. Now, what did the cleanup itself look like? Well, in places it looked like this, which is not very pretty. This is Grand Isle, which is south of New Orleans proper. But as often as not, it looked more like this. Pretty simple stuff, high-tech equipment, booms, or it looked like this. And in this field of view, everything is oiled except the extreme right side of the northeast quadrant, where it's very, very black. That's clean water. Everything else is oiled. The orange is oil that's been contacted by the dispersants. This is one of the uh, vessels of opportunity that was employed by BP. At one juncture, BP had 5,000 vessels under contract, 3,000 of which would be at sea on any given day. There were a lot of vessels used to help with the cleanup. And they burned it off. Now, those of us who work for big companies are accustomed to the idea of safety moments. We haven't had our safety moment here yet today, so I'm going to give it to you now. Are you ready? It is generally considered a bad idea to light the oil on fire when it's in contact with a producing facility. <laughs> this is not a good thing to do. And so that's your takeaway from this picture. And it took place with the spring of, of dispersants. In the right-hand picture, you can see little uh, streaks of orange where this aircraft, which is an Air Force aircraft, is doing a cross pattern. And it took place this way, too. Lots of little vessels and little planes and helicopters. So the corporations, when a spill occurs, the corporations have an ethical responsibility to provide protection to people first. First to clean up and restore the environment, to investigate and fix the cause, and to maintain a transparent flow of information. Now, to that last point, let me tell you that I was working for BP when this occurred. I had no access to any information that you didn't have access to, none. 
None. And BP had senior vice presidents of engineering giving briefings daily. In my professional experience, I have never seen a company handle an industrial accident with as much outreach and sharing of information as BP did. I'm no big fan of BPs, but they should get credit for what they did there. <clears throat> Unfortunately, what the public saw and what the public generally thinks about is the impression that these three gentlemen left when they were testifying at the Senate. And this is from left to right, BP Halliburton, or BP Transocean and Halliburton. And these gentlemen were actually doing a pretty good job, too, in trying to fulfill an ethical responsibility. Be reminded that BP's stock price fell from approximately 60 to 28 in the week following the spill, the initiation of the spill. The corporation lost more than half of its market capitalization. The corporation almost failed. Right? So what were these guys doing? These guys were trying to answer questions from the United States government, do it truthfully, and not say something that was going to cost them later when they all went to court with one another, which is where they are now. And they were protecting you and me, because the people that own big oil 70% of what the owners of big oil are individual investors, pension funds that we own, and IRAs that we own. 70%. They were protecting you and me. And I want them to do that. Now, there were times when the impressions left were far more negative. Right? And this gentleman is an example of that. And I think the best lesson that can be taken away from the testimony he provided or didn't provide is that appearances make an enormous difference. And the appearance he presented was extremely negative. Rather than focus on that, though, what I would ask is that we focus on what are the responsibilities a corporation has before a spill occurs. And those are to train their people and maintain their skills, to maintain equipment properly, and to establish clear management systems. This is the list that I came up with in the summer of 2010. This is the list, the same list, that the President's Special Commission came up with. And I would point out to you that the first and the third items, the training and maintenance of skills and the establishment of clear management systems, are right at the root of the criminal indictments that were filed two weeks ago. Clear management systems and well-trained people who knew what they were doing and how to interpret pressure tests. <clears throat> let's move from the corporations and let's talk about people who work here in the Capitol. And let's start with this gentleman as an example, only as an example. Mr. Markey from Massachusetts, who's the chair of the House Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming, who likes to talk about how the oil companies are turning the American consumer upside down at the pump, shaking out every last cent, while the White House is defending unnecessary giveaways and tax breaks. And he goes on and has said, and these are direct quotes, if we're going to allow giant oil companies like BP to deplete, to deplete our ocean energy resources, we will take a small sliver of their massive profits and deposit it in a conservation fund. Hmm. Pretty inflammatory. So let's parse this. Let's parse this. Massive profits. ExxonMobil in the most recent quarter reported $8.4 billion in profits. This is independent of sales of assets, because I'm going to compare them to other people who didn't sell assets. Mm -hmm. right, that was, amounted to 6.5% of their revenue stream, and they report about a 6.5% margin. Okay. What about Google? Google in the last quarter reported $2.7 billion in profits, which was 19% of their revenue stream. And my favorite is Apple, which is now the largest publicly traded firm in the world. And in the last quarter, they reported $8.2 billion, 23% of their revenue, and a 40% margin. Which one's making massive profits? Hmm. About shaking every last cent out at the pump, if we look at profit in terms of pennies per dollar of cash flow. Oil and gas 
companies average 6.7 cents per dollar. 6.7 cents. Computers and peripherals, on the other hand, make 21.8 cents per dollar. Pharmaceuticals make 22.2 cents per dollar. And all industry, all manufacturing makes 9.2. 9.2. These numbers come from API. Which one is really shaking out every last cent? And in terms of unnecessary tax breaks and giveaways, if we look at subsidies provided per megawatt hour of electricity generated, so we're just going to stick with energy fields right now. Ready? Ready for this? This will be illuminating. All right. All hydrocarbons, coal, oil, and natural gas, get 64 cents per megawatt hour of electricity generated. Hydro still gets 82 cents, and this is just dams. I mean, how tough is it to operate a dam? Nuclear gets three dollars and 14 cents. Wind, 56 dollars and change, and. The star in the list, solar, gets $775 and change per megawatt of power generated. Which ones are getting a lot of tax giveaways and breaks? And in terms of depleting our natural resources, what people forget is the massive amount of money that gets spent at lease sales, some of which never comes back, all of which goes to the federal treasury, the money that's recouped in royalties by the federal government, and after the oil companies have paid all of that, then they pay taxes on the rest of it. And so here's a comparison of various industries. And here, effective tax rates averaged 2005 to 2009. And please note that the US, where the company of affiliation is noted, the US is always the biggest number. The breakdown on the right side, are those company names? Those are company names, and, and above each percentage is company name that you'll be able to see better when you download this to yourself, and the country that they report their taxes to. All right. Now, prevaricating is, is not a uh, Democratic exclusive. The Republican Party does the same thing. And I was accused when I first made this presentation in, in Anchorage in April of last year that I was picking on Democrats. Here is Mr. Scalise from Louisiana, who you see came to a hearing, most importantly, to make a presentation, because he has his oil bird picture, and who was choosing to speak rather than listen, as you can tell by his pursed lips. My challenge here is that legislative bodies have a responsibility, an ethical responsibility, to investigate when it's appropriate. And it's not at all clear that it was appropriate for them to be investigating this at all to listen to testimony that they've solicited, to minimize sensationalism, which is tough because the tendency to do that is genetically encoded on the politician gene, and to formulate laws thoughtfully, formulate laws thoughtfully. Up through April of this year, 2012, according to Baker Botts, one of the leading environmental law firms in Washington, D.C., there had been, since the Macondo spill started, 140 separate congressional hearings related to it, 140. There has been zero legislation passed, zero. So what are these folks doing? All right. The people who should have investigated and did were these people, the Coast Guard and what had been the MMS by its various incarnations, reincarnations now. I heard a lot of their testimony streamed live. I've seen two of the three volumes of their reports, which came out looking like inch thick yearbooks. And they did an excellent, excellent job. Truly a very, very good, thorough job. Unfortunately, they were upstaged by the delivery of this report. This is the report that came out in December of 2010 from the President's Special Commission. And I realize it's difficult for you to read the title because it fuzzes out. So I will read it to you. And what it says is the deep water, the Gulf oil disaster, and the future of offshore drilling the future of offshore drilling. Now, you'll recall that every year we have multiple coal, expo coal mine explosions and fires. Many, many people get killed. There were 2,000 miners killed in Chinese mines alone last year. 2,000. Right? Do we talk about the future of underground coal mining? You'll remember that there are 
commercial aviation accidents every year. Planes go down, hundreds of people die. Do we discuss the future of commercial aviation? Of course not. So why does one industrial accident precipitate a report that at the senior, most senior executive level in our government starts to question, well, should we even be exploring offshore? And I would posit to you that it's part of that more complicated social fabric that I'm going to try and illuminate for you as we go on through this discussion. <clears throat> Regulatory agencies have an ethical responsibility to perform their oversight diligently. And they had not done that before this spill. To investigate thoroughly, though they are doing that, to modify regulations appropriately, well, that remains to be seen. They're still struggling with the regulations. And to restore operations timely. We have finally, now, more than two years after the spill, finally gotten to a turnaround rate on leasing permits for deep water that matched what it was prior to the spill. We have not yet gotten to the volume of leases that were issued per unit of time. So let's move on to that uh, yellow disk. Journalistic ethics. And um, any of you who have followed Rupert Murdoch's travails over the last year can appreciate the oxymoronic juxtaposition that this presents to us. And I'm, I'm going to pick on this gentleman to start. And I'm not going to read all these words. They come from the Presidential Commission report. Suffice it to say that he in particular was singled out in that report for requesting that state and local officials and residents come on his show and display their anger at the federal response and at the oil companies. He asked a particular parish president, and I think we can figure out which one that was, to bring people from his parish on who would display that anger. And when they couldn't promise that the people would be angry enough, he disinvited them. And the commission felt that this was aliasing the reporting that the public was due. <clears throat> we don't need we don't need and should expect more than a bunch of trash talk and entertainment <laughs> from the news. And no, this was not a photoshopped picture. <laughs> he really did appear on Grouch News Network. Right. The, um, the print media generally did a better job. The blogosphere is horrific. Here's a piece of equipment that came out called the Sand Shark. It was built for BP, and its role is to uh, pick up dirty sand, clean it, discharge it into a truck on the back end, and then redistribute it to restored beach. The headline that came out with that was this one. BP Sand Shark hunts tar ball prey on devastated Gulf Coast beaches. What one word stands out? Devastated. Devastated. All right. What wasn't reported still hasn't been reported is generally that although pieces of heavy equipment were brought in from time to time to work the beaches, more often than not, cleanup didn't involve much more than a guy walking down the sandy beach with a golf ball retriever looking for something to pick up. Right? And that while people were doing this, and they were still doing it 18 months later, because I saw them doing it on Pensacola's beaches when I was there over the holidays, this kind of activity was also going on, on the same beaches. So I'll draw your attention to the photograph in the lower left. And there, in the background, are the excavator and the sand shark that I just showed you. So where I have gotten crosswise with the esteemed business editor for the local paper here in Houston is when I suggested and observed that BP had been coerced into putting up $20 billion by the Obama administration as a down payment on what all the damages were going to be and what the cleanup was going to cost. And I suggested that since they were supposedly offsetting economic damage as well, that BP should get half its money back and that the media should put up $10 billion. Because a lot of the damage was caused in tourism-related activities. And the tourists didn't come because of what they heard from the media. And the media said the beaches had all been devastated. Mr. Steffi didn't like that idea. <laughs> all right. My point here is that the media have an ethical responsibility to deliver information. It used to be you couldn't get an FCC license renewed 
unless you were demonstrating a public good. That's what created or caused to be created the evening news. That was the public good that stations were demonstrating in order to renew their federal communication license every year. We don't have that anymore with cable and satellite. Differentiate opinion and advocacy from reporting. That's really important, and it doesn't happen. Avoid sensationalism, and avoid worst case scenario focus. There's a gentleman in uh, Petroleum Engineering Department at the University of Houston, Dr. Dalhousie, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, who was another talking head during all of the spill. And by his count, he gave 140 interviews, 143 interviews. And all of them, when he was asked what they had in common, all of them were looking for worst case scenario focus. That's all they wanted to hear. All right? Now, why am I harping on the media? I'm harping on the media because people all over the world, United States included, get most of what they think is information from cable, from broadcasts. It's being said on TV. It must be true, right? I live in Katy. I live in one of the top two school districts in the state. All of my neighbors are college educated. I have neighbors in whose, in whose homes a newspaper has never landed, a magazine never comes, and in whose homes I have never seen a book other than their children's school books. And when something goes wrong someplace, they do what everyone else does. They turn their backs and they go to the cable and they want to know, well, what's really happening? I'm going to get it from XYZ station. Well, why is this a problem? Well, this is a problem because only a quarter of our citizens are considered to be scientifically literate. Scientifically literate. Now, what does that mean? Empirically, that means that only a quarter of our population is able to read and understand the Sunday science section in the New York Times, which is written at the same level as a college textbook, and that's at the ninth grade level. One in can do that. Now that's empirically. The California Academy of Sciences has quantified this force, as has a number of other studies, but let's work with the California Academy study first. And they quantified it by looking at questions like this. That they found that only 53% of adults know how long it takes the Earth to revolve around the sun. You can't make this stuff up, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Only 59% of adults know that the earliest humans and dinosaurs did not live at the same time. Fred Flintstone and Barney Rubble notwithstanding. All right. Only 47% of adults can roughly approximate the percentage of the Earth's surface that's covered with water. Right. And most frightening at all, of all, only 21% could answer all three questions correctly. Mm. I would challenge that our citizens, including you and I, have an ethical responsibility to one another to become educated and then to use that education to become informed and to question and to understand the full societal context of the issues that surround a discussion about oil spills and the future of offshore drilling. And that you and I, while we have responsibilities to perform our work diligently, to perform our work without prejudice, we also have ethical responsibilities to identify and point out inaccuracies when we see them, and to inform people around us, and to explain those full societal contexts. We have to do that, because if we don't, people who work in marble palaces like this and wear funny clothes to work like that are going to make the decisions for us. And this is not a group known for its scientific insights. Now, I will give you a factoid here. It has not been verified, but I have been told that that same California Academy study was performed on a significant, major, long-standing, prestigious East Coast Ivy League institution. Faculty, staff, graduate students, undergraduate students and the results were the same. 
I can tell you, I have students at Rice who can't tell you what the parts of an atom are and don't know what the Milky Way is. Okay? I'm also informed that half of these people went to that institution. <laughs> I don't want them making decisions for me when it comes to science. So I started this piece of our conversation by looking at all of these constituencies. And I would suggest that we need to help people stop thinking that way and they need to start thinking this way that we're also part of something much, much bigger. Much, much bigger. We have to start thinking that way. And that brings me to the third part of the presentation, which is, well, what are all these other social issues that an oil spills consideration is embedded in? What are they? And I've identified four. Now I'm going to start with demand growth. When I was a kid, when I was in elementary school in the 1950s, right before I started in the industry, <laughs> at age two, there were three billion people on the planet. And we hit seven billion people last Halloween, October of 2011. We're going to have another billion in 14 years, according to the demographers. <coughs> okay. Half the people on the planet today don't have access to electricity. Half the people on the planet today don't have access to clean water. They consider these to be fundamental human rights. We have them, you and I. They want the opportunity to live like we live as we exploit hydrocarbon energy that has made it possible for us to have those things. It is the most energy dense source we have. They want that too. And we can't conserve our way to take care of the other half of the world's population today. How are we going to conserve our way to another billion? We can't do that. Oil, gas, coal supply constraints. Well, that's what we make a living at, isn't it? You and I trying to relieve those constraints, find more stuff, create new opportunities. Energy security challenges, they're always going to be there. And then rising climate change concerns. That's really at the crux of why that report was titled the way it was when it hit the president's desk, the future of offshore drilling. It's because it's a carbon source. And carbon puts CO2 in the atmosphere. And a lot of people seem to believe that we're causing climate change by doing that. So. Why don't we talk about that for a couple of minutes? This is a chart that was in the 2005 IPCC report, the Intergovernmental Pla Panel on Climate Change report. It was prepared, it's called the Sokolow Wedge. It was prepared by Bob Sokolow, who's a professor at Princeton and some of his colleagues. And what they looked at was, you can see on the y-axis, uh, billions of tons of carbon emitted per year. And on the x-axis, you can see time. And they look at historical emissions. And then they took the position that the IPCC was espousing and said, well, we want to cap our emissions at this level and eventually drive them down after 50 years. And they said, well, if we keep going the way we are, we're going to have all these extra emissions, these, this big green wedge. And they said, well, let's break that big green wedge into several pieces and see how we might attack that and do something about it and get some perspective about what that would mean. Because right? you don't ever hear that, do you? Oh, well, let's go solar. We can solve the world's problems. Let's, let's see what this means. What they came up with were seven different categories and eight different solutions. Right? Eight different wedges. You don't have to read this. I'm going to break them down one at a time. Here's the summary so you can see where I'm headed. All right? Efficiency. To get one-eighth of that green wedge. Each of these is going to be one-eighth of that big green wedge. We could double the efficiency of two billion cars from 30 to 60 miles per gallon. Okay, now, where'd they get those numbers? Well, there's 600 million cars in the world today. Projection is two billion by 2054. So one wedge is double the average fuel efficiency of the entire world fleet. Now, my first car was a 1970 Torino GT with a 351 Cleveland engine, a four-barrel Holley car. It would go zero to 60 in just under five seconds and could do a mile in under a minute. It was wonderful. 
I got 13 miles per gallon. Okay? And CAFE standards were already in place. Corporate average fuel efficiency standards were already in place. Right? My current vehicle is a few years old now, not many, and it was marketed to me as an energy fuel efficient vehicle. It gets 13 miles per gallon. Okay? I have not got a lot of optimism that we can pull this off. Fuel switching. We could replace 1,400 coal plants with gas facilities. Holy moly. All right? Adding an amount in gas equal to today's gas usage. The first natural gas well was drilled in western New York in 1830s, 1837, I believe. We have been building a natural gas producing, gathering, treating, redistribution system for 175 years. And the challenge here for one-eighth of that big green wedge is to double that by 2055. Who's going to pay for that? Who's going to pay for that? It means we would have to bring one Alaska pipeline online every year for 50 years or have 50 large LNG tankers docking and discharging daily. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't think there are 50 tankers that size on the planet, much less capable of having 50 of them discharging per day. Who's going to pay for that? And you've all seen the kerfuffle that attended the Keystone XL pipeline. We couldn't get one pipe across one state that's already littered with pipelines. But we're going to do this. Carbon capture and storage. We could capture and store the emissions from 800 coal electric plants. Hmm. Okay, What's that mean? There are today zero, zero at-scale demonstration projects for CO2 injection and sequestration. There are three projects of which I'm aware that do put a fair amount of gas away, a fair amount of CO2 away. Snowbeat and Sleipner in the North Sea, both of which are operated by Statoil Hydro, and Insala, the one that's in the picture here, in North Africa, in Algeria, operated by BP, which Statoil Hydro also has an interest in. Right? They put away between 5 and 10 percent of what a 1,000 megawatt power plant puts out. 5 and 10 percent. Okay? So to make this happen, we would need 3,500 of those. 3,500. And we can't get people in this country to approve even a half-scale test because they don't want it under their backyard. Remember the NIMBYs from the 70s and 80s, not in my backyard? Well, the CO2 injection community has discovered NIMBYs, not under my backyard. And a more, more dangerous group, the bananas, build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. Right? That's what we're confronting for one-eighth of that wedge. Right? Nuclear. We can take care of one of those wedges with nuclear. These are pictures of the Fukushima Daiichi plant. Right? On the left and on the right, the reaction to that plant. Now, let me tell you something that hasn't made the press. You ready? Those plants, those reactor vessels did exactly what they were designed to do. They withstood a magnitude 9 earthquake. That's what they were designed to do. So what went wrong? What went wrong? What went wrong is that people ignored all these little monuments that are scattered all over the hills of northeastern Japan that are hundreds of years old, many of them, and they all have little inscriptions on them. You can see that right here, and there's some more faint down here. And those inscriptions all say about the same thing that this one says. And the translation for this one is, high dwellings are the peace and harmony of our descendants. Remember the calamity of the great tsunamis, and do not build any homes below this point. Okay. The water from the tsunami at Fukushima Daiichi got to an elevation of 157 feet up the hillsides. 
157 feet, but that's with wash, right? Here's what it looked like. Here's what it looked like. That's a 150 foot high splash, right? Created when the tsunami impacted the turbine building, right? Passed over its roof and struck the reactor building. The lower height structures, including the diesel generators, were already underwater at this point. Okay? The plan was protected by a 19 foot seawall. The wave, the tsunami, reached a height of 46 feet. TEPCO, Tokyo Electric Power Company, knew 12 years before the tsunami that the seawall was inadequate because of more recent geologic mapping along that coast. And they decided to ignore it because it would cost money to fix the seawall. Remember the sources of error <coughs> for our industrial accidents? Human error, and in this case, hubris. Okay, so let's return. Nuclear, what would it mean? Well, we could add double the current global nuclear capacity to replace coal-based electricity. Okay. There are 400 nuclear plants in the world today. One wedge would mean 700 more in the next 50 years. Now, 700 replaces the 400 and builds 300 new ones. Okay. Okay, the last, there has not been a power plant built a nuclear power plant built in the United States since 1976 when Three Mile Island occurred. The first new build permit was issued by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in December of 2011. Okay? 35 years later. It takes 10 to 12 billion dollars to build one of these things. It takes 10 years to get one permitted. Another 8 to 10 years to build it. What this means, these numbers, is that we have to complete one every three and a half weeks for the next 50 years. Who's going to pay for that? Wind. We could increase wind electricity capacity by 50 times with two million large windmills. Two million. Okay? So one wedge means windmills on 372,000 square miles which is equivalent to all of the acreage in North and South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, and Oklahoma combined. Not that that's where we would build them, but that gives you some scale. That's what that much countryside is. Okay? And do keep in mind, do keep in mind that in this country, even sites 12 miles offshore have been disapproved by local voters because it would either, A, ruin their viewscape from 12 miles away, or <laughs> interfere with their yacht races. <coughs> <coughs> and also be aware that the operators of all the major wind farms in the United States have all applied for exemption from prosecution under the Endangered Species Act because these things are like food processors to migrating birds. Solar. Use 40,000 square kilometers of panels to produce hydrogen for fuel cell cars. I refer to this as the Hindenburg Energy Project. <coughs> So solar panels covering an area of 230,000 square miles. So three, three and a half of those states, again, I'll give you back one and a half. Be aware that the Bureau of Land Management has solicited this year for proposals to put solar panels like this on 19 million acres of federal land. 19 million acres. And, and there's a letter of protest from a collection of three environmental groups in California who are objecting for two reasons. You ready for this? Can't make this stuff up. First objection is that this amounts to permanent privatization of public lands, because you can't use it for anything else if you're doing all this. And their second objection is that no study has demonstrated that the use of solar panels to generate electricity would reduce CO2 emissions. And it might even increase it because they're going to stir up the dust and dirt and cause things to move into the atmosphere that aren't there now but are stable. Isn't that interesting? And natural sinks. This one's kind of interesting because <clears throat> you can only use natural sinks once. Right? You grow the tree, it takes the CO2 out of the atmosphere, your forest reach climax stage, 
And what happens? The trees die, they rot, CO2 goes back into the atmosphere. So this is a one-time thing. We could eliminate tropical deforestation and create new plantations on non-forested land to quintuple current plantation area. What's that mean? It means we need 2.3 million square miles of plantations, which is equivalent to two-thirds of either the US or Brazil or Australia or about half of China. Now, last time I was in Brazil, it looked pretty well forested, so I can't do this in Brazil. If interior China and Australia could support forests, they'd already be there, but they're not because they're deserts. And that leaves the heartland of the United States, which is the grain basket for much of the world, still. I don't think that's what we want to do, because we have an ethical responsibility not to burn as fuel or to lock up land that could provide food for people that are starving all over the place. That's my view. And then finally, what you have to consider is that these resources, these unconventional resources, or your ability to employ them, are distributed rather unevenly around the world. They're distributed around the world as are proven gas reserves. But just like with gas reserves, where they are isn't where they get used, which means you have to have either pipeline systems, train systems, or transmission systems to move the electrons. And we've seen how successful T. Boone Pickens was trying to get wind-generated electrons from West Texas to Fort Worth. He couldn't get that approved. And even if we did all of this, would it make a lick of difference? No. If the United States had burned no hydrocarbons for the last 10 years, the CO2 in the atmosphere would have still increased. And the United States is a quarter of the world's economy. A quarter. Right? A quarter of the GDP comes from the United States. Right? If we burn no hydrocarbons for the next 10 years, CO2 in the atmosphere will still go up. Because the lesser developed countries <clears throat> are building power plants like they're going out of style. China is completing a 1,000 megawatt power plant, coal-fired power plant, per week per week. Now, they are the world's second largest economy, but they feel they should be exempt from anything that has to do with climate change controls. And that's what's being argued this week in Doha, in Qatar, that they should be exempt and the United States should curb completely its emissions, while the third world, in Asia most notably, does this into the future. Why are they arguing that? They're arguing that because they recognize the energy density of hydrocarbons. And they want us to kill our economies so that they can advance theirs. So what are your takeaways? I want you to remember that according to climate scientists, the most significant greenhouse gas we have to contend with is water vapor, and that none of the models adequately deal with it or the change in albedo that high altitude clouds create. None of them. I want you to remember that we have the lives that we have because of the energy density that hydrocarbons afford us, that U.S. demand is projected to continue growing, that Saudi Arabia demand for its own production by Saudi's numbers will reach 50% by 2035 and 100% by 2050. 100% of Saudi production will stay in country by 2050. Think about what that does to world markets and prices. And that the economic growth in China and India is still continuing at 7 to 9%, closer to the 7 now than the 9, but still growing. Right? My point here is that ultimate responsibilities for oil spills lie within this mix of competing demands and expectations. And that this mix is far more complicated than most people are willing to consider or are even aware of. All right? And that all, all energy consumers have an ethical obligation to educate ourselves and those around us regarding the consequences of our demands for cheap energy and a preserved environment cheap energy and a preserved environment. Right. 
that's what everyone wants. Okay? And how are we going to get educated? Well, here's your assignment. I want you to go do that. All of you, each of you, may have this deck. Take it and use it. Talk to your garden club, your poker buddies, anybody, and push public discussion further. Educate the people around you. That's my request of you. I, uh, I want to thank the AAPG Foundation for uh, underwriting my um, itinerant lifestyle this last 18 months. Thank you for having me. But now, if it's all the same to you, and with your permission, I'm going to return to my day job. <laughs> Have a Merry Christmas. <laughs> So I'd like to thank uh, Rusty on behalf of the HGS uh, for this talk, very informative. And since you've done it 63 times, I imagine you've probably got 63 awards to hang in your office. So in our efforts to conserve energy, we give you a really small award <laughs> that you can put in your office, not a big one, and we're not using as much waste in the world today. All right, so thanks but a lot. But you're supporting the mining industry. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, thanks everybody for coming out.